And you know, we Christians often display that tendency. Something that belongs to something else. And it's not always material things. It's not always money or things. Sometimes it's a talent or it's an ability that is beyond our reach. Boy, I wish I was like that person. I wish I had that ability or I wish... It can seem so much more appealing than what we possess, than what we have as human beings. Yet the Lord wants us to be satisfied with the way he has created us and what he has given to us. Praise you for eternity. And Lord, I love you. Because you, you first loved me. It's a beauty of simplicity that fills me with eternity. I've tasted your divinity. This morning we are going to continue with our series, Unknown Men of the Bible. Maybe some of you have heard of this guy. He's a little more popular than the other two that we've talked about. This guy's name is Gehazi. Gehazi was a servant to the prophet Elisha. If you'd like to open your Bibles, we're going to take a look at 2 Kings chapter 5. And we'll start that in just a few moments. A few years ago in Boston, two bodies of elderly ladies were discovered in their small apartment. They had died a few days earlier, and an autopsy revealed that they had died of mal malnutrition. But hidden in mattresses and sewn up in pillows and draperies was nearly $200,000. The ladies died because they didn't use what they had to meet their daily needs. In reality, the bottom line was greed killed these ladies. Did you ever think about getting a large sum of money? What would you do if somebody said they would give you $2 million? What, to what extent would you go to get two million dollars. There was a book written that was called The Day America Told the Truth and out of ten questions asked two-thirds of the respondents agreed they would do at least one of the following and some even said several of the following. What were the deeds that they would do for to receive two million dollars? Twenty-five percent said they would abandon their family for two million dollars. 25% said they would abandon their church for $2 million. 23% said they would become a prostitute for a week or longer. 16% said they would give up their American citizenship for $2 million. 16% said they would leave their spouse for that kind of money. 10% said they would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free for $2 million. 7% said they'd kill a stranger. 6% said they'd change their race. 4% said they would have a sex operation, sex change operation. And 3% said they would put their children up for adoption. I guess that would depend on the day, huh? Uh, some of you kids are laughing, teenagers. <laughs> you know, when greed is involved, covetousness is usually right there with it. They're, they're real close cousins. One cannot read the Bible without finding incident after incident where man wanted that which wasn't theirs. I mean, think about it. The Garden of Eden, Eve coveted the forbidden fruits. 
Achan coveted some gold, silver, and expensive garments which brought defeat to the whole nation and death to him and his family. Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard and murdered him to get it. David coveted Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit because they were covetous. Today we're going to talk about the downfall of Gehazi. And in this chapter that we're going to take a look at, we're going to see that, in fact, let me just give you the, the story in a nutshell, okay? We have this man called Nahum. Nahum is the captain of the army for the Armenians. And Nahum gets leprosy. Now, leprosy is a banishable disease. You've you got to be banished if, if you have leprosy. But there is a servant that tells Nahum, there's a guy in Israel that can cure you of leprosy. So he gets permission from the king, and the king gets permission from the other king, and everything is all right, and they're going. And, and Nahum goes to see Elisha. Now, Elisha doesn't even come out to see Nahum. Elisha says, go and dunk yourself in the Jordan River seven times, you'll be healed. Oh, Nahum is furious. The guy didn't even come out to see me, and he wants me to, and, and I preached a message called Seven Ducks in a Muddy River, and that's talking about Nahum. But he says he wants me to go dunk myself in a muddy river. Where there's cleaner rivers where I came from. And a little maid came, maiden came up to him and said, uh, Master, if he told you to do something great, would you have done it? Oh, yeah. Then why don't you do this? This is pretty simple. So Nahum goes to the Jordan River and ducks himself seven times, and guess what? He comes out clean. Leprosy is completely gone. Oh, man. He is feeling wonderful. So he goes back to Nahum, I mean back to uh, Elisha, and he wants to pay him. I mean, the guy is a multi-millionaire. And he's brought all this stuff with him. And he wants to pay Elisha for this wonderful service that he's done for him. And Elisha says, no, nah, I don't want it. I don't want it. And so we pick up the story there. Nahum is leaving. And before we get to the meat of the story, let me tell you how the story ends. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 27, the scripture says, Nahum's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Now, this is Elisha talking to Gehazi. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. So this morning we're going to take a look at the things that Gehazi did that led to this awful punishment at the end of the chapter, this punishment of leprosy. So the first thing that Gehazi did, and I'm starting with your notes now, if you'd like to follow along, also on our Facebook page is a copy of our notes. Those that are watching by television, you can get them at our Facebook page. Verse uh, 20, the scripture says, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to, to himself, now this is where we get in trouble before I go on. When we start talking to ourselves, man, look out. Yeah, have you ever had one of those conversations? Self, I think I'm going to, oh man, look out. Because there's nobody talk, to talk you out of it. You've already got yourself talked into it. So it says that he talked to himself, and he says, Self, my master was too easy on Nahum, this Armenian, not by accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him, and I will get something from him. Now, Elisha, uh, Gehazi's master, refused the treasures already. 
But Gehazi coveted them. He wanted them. He desired them. You know, Donald Trump one time said, you can't be too greedy. Well, I'm glad Donald Trump isn't the last word on this stuff because here's what Jesus says in Mark chapter 7. He says, with evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, idolatry, greed, wickedness, deceit, eagerness for lustful uh, pleasure, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Jesus put them all together and look what he included. Greed. It's right there. You can be too greedy. You can be covetousness in your very desires. So Gehazi had this desire and then he takes his desire to the next step which he makes a decision. There's the decision of Gehazi. In verse 21, the scripture says, So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. Gehazi was so covetous that it caused him to secretly follow. He didn't say to Elisha, Hey, Elisha, I'm going to go and get some stuff from Nahum. No, no. He secretly left, and we'll see that in a little bit in the Scripture. Secretly left. His desire was to obtain something that belonged to Nahum. At first he had a desire, a thought, and now he decides, I'm putting this into action, so he's rushing to Nahum to get the loot. You know, a couple of donkeys were in two fields separated by a fence. And each field was just as lush as the other one. Each field was just as green as the other. But yet the donkeys were standing at the fence, reaching over to the other field as far as they could get. You know, it's the old saying that says, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And you know, we Christians often display that tendency. Something that belongs to something else. And it's not always material things. It's not always money or things. Sometimes it's a talent or it's an ability that is beyond our reach. Boy, I wish I was like that person. I wish I had that ability or I wish. Okay. It can seem so much more appealing than what we possess, than what we have as human beings. Yet the Lord wants us to be satisfied with the way he has created us and what he has given to us. So we have the desire, we have the decision, and now the deception. So it says, when Nahum saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. He said, hey, is everything okay? Is everything all right? Everything's all right, Gehazi said. My master sent me. So when Nahum saw him coming, he immediately got off his chariot. I mean, this guy had a disease that was incurable. This guy went as white as white could be with leprosy, and he was leaving. And the scripture says his skin was like that of a baby. He immediately got down from his chariot to meet him, wanted to know, hey, is everything okay? And Gehazi says, my master sent me to say, two young men from the company of prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothes. Gehazi told him a deliberate lie. He said, my master sent me. His master didn't even know that he had left the house. I wonder what was going through his mind to do such a thing. I wonder if he's thinking, you know, Nahum should pay for that healing. Or maybe he needs to pay for the services that are rendered. It's like going to the doctor's office, you know. Pay for the services that are rendered, you're healed. Or he might have thought, this guy has got the loot, and I want some of it. <coughs> Whatever it is, he had made a deliberate lie to try to get some of it. Now, there was a little girl came to 
her mother one morning and asked, Mom, which is worse, to tell a lie or to steal? Well, the mother replied, they're both sinful, and she really didn't know which one was worse than the other. Well, Mama, the little girl replied, I've been thinking about this a great deal. I think it's ever so much worse to lie than to steal. And the mother said, why, why are you saying that? Well, how come you came to that conclusion? She says, if you steal something, you can always give it back. Or if you eat it, if it's something you can eat, you can always pay for it. She said, but, and there was this very look of awe in her face. She says, a lie is forever. Once it comes out of your mouth, it's said. You might be, uh, you may be successfully, uh, you might successfully deceive someone, but we will never, ever deceive God. Keep that in mind. In fact, the Lord says that we're going to be responsible for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. Wow. That's going to be a lot of words, isn't it? Well, Nahum is tickled that he's healed. He was tickled to pay Elisha whatever he wanted. So he gets down from his chariot. He says, by all means. And he doesn't say just one talent. He says, take two talents. And he urged Gehazi to accept them. And he tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave the two to, uh, to, to two of his servants, and they even carried them for Gehazi. So he not only gave him double the money, but he also had his servants take them back to the house. The story of the two sons of prophets, it was a pretty silly story to start with. Uh, and it was definitely false. I mean, if he would have begged for a token for the two young scholars, surely less than a talent would be all that they needed. But see, the captain, Captain Nahum, was so gracious for what the prophet of God had done for him, he didn't even question it. He said, man, take it and go. So that's where Gehazi was in this whole story. Let's take a look at where Elisha is in this whole story. In verse 24, when Gehazi came over the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. And when he went in and stood before his master, Elisha, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? So after receiving the treasure, he couldn't let Elisha see it right away. I mean, there had been too many questions. He couldn't let Elisha see the servants who carried the stuff. There would have been too many questions. So before they kind of got over the hill, he says, how about you let me carry it, you head on back to your master, and I'll take care of it from here. And he would put it away, so no one would know where it was at, and he would secretly return to the loot later on. So in verse 25, it says, When he went, out, went in, he stood before his master. Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And here's Gehazi's response. Your servant didn't go anywhere. Well, just in case his absence had been noticed... Gehazi rushed in without being called to appear before his master. You see, it was customary back in those days when somebody had a disciple or somebody had a servant, a personal servant, they stayed with that person throughout the day unless the master sent them on some sort of errand or something to do. Then they would go and they would uh, leave the person in order to execute that job. So Elisha asked, his, uh, uh, asked him, where have you been? Well, nowhere. He might have said, oh, I was out in the yard, or out, in the out of the house, whatever. Note, one lie commonly begets 
another lie. And that's the way of sin. It's all downhill. Had an English teacher one time ask one of the fellows that was in our neighborhood in high school, he says, Jeff, are you a good sled rider? He says, well, yeah, he says, I'm a good sled rider. He says, I noticed you're very good at going downhill. Of course, he was talking about his grades. And this is the same way with sin. It's this downhill trek. So, Elisha makes a declaration. Verse 26 goes on, But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Oh, I could see it now. Gehazi's heart just sank. How did he know? I remember one time I left my trumpet in the school bus. I thought, my parents are going to be mad at me. I get off the bus and I walk into the house and I'm not there for 10 minutes and my mom says, okay, let's get in the car. I said, where are we going? She said, well, we have to go to get your trumpet out of the school bus. How did she know? There were no cell phones, no email, no Facebook, nothing. We had one telephone in the house that rang, you know, ding-a-ling-a-ling. I didn't hear it ring. How did she know? Of course, we had done the same to our boys. There were times we would say something. How did they know that? You know, the, the neat thing about parents is we don't have to tell them. My parents never told me. We never told our boys, and I'm sure they'll do the same with their kids. Elisha says, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or accept clothes? Oh man, he not only knew that Nahum got down from the chariot, but he knows what he gave me. Oh, I am in trouble. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, olive groves and vineyards, or flocks and herds, or male and female slaves. Why did he do all that? He knows that he only got money. He knows that he only got clothes. But you see, if Elisha would have left that go, there's a possibility the next time it would have been olive groves or vineyards. And then the next time, it could have been flocks and herds to where he was buying and selling people. Friends, we cannot let sin get a foothold in our lives. And God will warn us of that. And if we don't take the warning, it could get bigger and bigger and bigger. Had Gehazi yet to learn that the prophets had spiritual eyes? Or could he think to hide anything from the seer? From him to whom carried the secrets of the Lord? Elisha definitely had an open line to God. I mean, Here's the life of Elisha, what Gehazi had seen of his life up until this point. Elisha purified water. He cursed boys that jeered him, and 42 of them were killed by bears. He instructed the Israelites to the victory over the Moabites. Here's a widow that couldn't pay her bills, he says, go get your jar of oil and get as many empty jars as you can and fill them all up. And she did with that one jar. She filled them all up. He says, now go and sell so you can pay your bills. He prophesied that a woman would have a son. And she had a son. 
And not only that, a few years later, the son died and he brought him back to life. <coughs> he made poisonous stew fit to eat. And then he took two, uh, 20 loaves of bread and stretched it that a hundred people would eat and be satisfied and there would be food left over. I mean, it was foolish for Gehazi to attempt what he did. You know, sin blinds people to the real circumstances and consequences that they will have to deal with. Above all, it destroys their power of sensing the presence of God. Gehazi assumed that Elisha wouldn't find out. All sinners assume that, that God won't find out. I mean, the jails are overflowing today because people assumed what they did wrong, nobody would find out about. Isn't doing sin a stupid thing for us? But yet we continue to keep doing it. Well, now we get to the defilement of Gehazi. Verse 27, and I read this at the beginning, Nahum's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Gehazi's leprosy was an outward sign of an inward spiritual condition. The fact that Gehazi's moral nature had been permanently damaged. Gehazi could never regain his integrity. He had to carry that leprosy with him to his grave. And so Gehazi went to live with the lepers and to mourn for a lifetime of folly and wickedness, which led him to throw away the fellowship that he had with Elisha and the confidence that he had with Elisha. You see, greed leads you down the wrong path. It produces within you the wrong motivations. And greed establishes the wrong authority in your life. You see, I just said up here that Gehazi's integrity was ruined because he had lied to God, he had lied to his master, he had lied to himself. What he did was he took the authority to himself. He became the authority. He says, I will run after him and I will get something from him. Gehazi undermined God's authority. The path of greed will eventually cause you to break God's laws. He lied to Nahum coming up with an elaborate story to get this treasure for himself. Nahum gives him two talents of silver and two sets of clothes, and then he goes and stashes the goods, uh, hides them. He goes to Elisha, and Elisha begins to question him, and Gehazi lies about where he had been, and one lie leads to another lie, which leads to another lie, and the end result is walking down the path of greed created the wrong motivation which leads to depending on the wrong authority, which caused judgment in his life. Notice judgment not only came upon Gehazi. You see, we think that our sin only affects us. No. His sin affected his family as well. 